All right. It is that time of the year. Flounder season is over. It's not quite striper season and everyone needs to catch some fish. Well, for me, this used to be the time where I'd say, eh, maybe I'll go for some tog. Uh, also known as tautog, blackfish, white chins. Um, but that's changed over the past few years. Part of the reason is one of the the guests that's, well, the guest that's going to be on tonight, um, who I'll introduce in a moment, but um, tonight is going to be all about TOG, and we're calling it TOG, TOG 101. So it's really how to get started for the fall fishing for TOG, which is in season right now throughout the mid-Atlantic, um, seeing some great catches up in New York already, some decent catches in New Jersey. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. And also have a bit of an announcement, want to let everyone know um, that we have a new co-host for the live streams and Ed, welcome back. Thank you, thank you. Welcome on board. Back. For those that uh, were were watching the stream a few weeks ago on Bucktails, Ed is the owner of Captain Hank's Tackle. Um, he's the one who makes the Bucktails that I use, and uh, he he and I have been talking a lot, going out fishing a few times, and uh, thought it'd be a great idea to have a co-host um so that we could have a little bit more conversation back and forth and it wasn't as heavily reliant upon a guest coming in so we could just talk fishing right so so that's what we're going to do so ed want to say hi hey what's up <laughs> good to be back <laughs> yeah and th this is a good topic tonight i think um obviously captain hanks is going to be focused on the the tog jigs uh coming up and uh Man, you look on social media and it is just all tog all the time. You see the striped bass moving in a little bit into the conversations. Um, some nice, nice size ones are being caught already, but just not in the numbers that they will be soon. Um, but yeah, it seems like a great time to talk about tog. And uh, we have a guest coming on tonight and I can bring him on screen right now. John Creeley, Creeley Custom Rods. Welcome, John. Thanks, Rich. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me too. Uh, thanks, Ed. I'm glad you're on the show as well it's great to see that yeah. uh, you have a co-host now it's uh it's definitely expanded and that's a good thing to see yeah so so john is actually the one who um you know i he's the one who got me kind of really turned back on to tog fishing right so for me i fished it a lot when i was a little kid um and that was back when you could, we would drop three hooks on a rig yeah. And uh, you drop it down. As soon as we hit bottom, you pull up three <laughs> every time. Now, they weren't all monsters. It was all inshore. I used to go on a rowboat out to a, to a bridge, um, a bridge, John, that you and I have fished before. And yes. we, I, we would just bail them. Um, you know, we wouldn't keep a lot, but we would, we would just bail them. Um, so, John, you want to talk a little bit about your tog experience and, and uh, what type of fishing you like to do? Um, pretty much it, it all goes back to, you know, Everyone started out fishing when they were a kid. Dad take you freshwater fishing, so on and so forth. Um, it wasn't until I moved back from Florida uh, when I was going to school that I got back in fishing. So I'd say probably about seven years ago, started out freshwater fishing. Um, and that's actually how me and you kind of met was when you started the Northeast Saltwater page. Um, I was posting a lot for the edge bait and tackle shop. Right. Um, so I was working there for a little bit, and then I got back into the uh, saltwater game. I'd say maybe four or five years ago is when I picked up on the tog fishing, um, which seems to be the story for everyone. Everyone just decided to pick up uh, tog fishing. Uh, for me, it was just something that I was intrigued about. And it doesn't matter. Go from the boat to rocks, land, wherever. It, it's They're there. As long as you know where you're going, you can find tog. To me, it's one of the best fighting fish around. You could use the lightest gear, and it, it could feel like a 50-pound fish when you're using like a trout rod. And that, that's just what I absolutely love about black fishing. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I mean, they, uh, I mean, all it, all it takes is catch a decent sized one and just look at the tail and just look at the power that that thing has. Um, and, and we could talk a little bit about it, you know, for, for those that are newer to tog fishing or they haven't caught tog in the past, they are, um, man, they're, they're a funky fish, incredibly slimy. They got those big gummy lips, um, They've got the the teeth and like the almost human like molars in the in the back. Um, so they got a really tough mouth, but really really gummy lips. Um, and and you got to remember that as we go through this conversation when we talk about tactics and and so on and so forth and how to catch them. Um, you know they're apparently up to thirty pounds. The world record was caught in New Jersey last year. I think it was twenty six eight. Uh, is uh, the world record? 
I think the the world record's actually twenty seven or twenty eight down in. Oh, Maryland. is it? The state record is twenty six eight now. So gotcha. Almost okay. broke the world record, but you know, definitely a heavy fifth last year. So yeah, a lot lot bigger than my personal best. <laughs> yeah, at least to say mine. So. <laughs> but but that's a that's a that's a heck of a fish right there um, at that size. So they get up to around thirty. Um, you know, there there's the uh, the one thing about them that I that I usually hear at the beginning when people are saying, well, I want to fish for them. And um, usually it comes up when you're fishing for striper and it's like, well, you go for tog, but if they're going at night, um, don't go at night. They sleep. Um, you will hear reports of people saying that they catch them at night. Um, but I, I haven't seen a credible report. And, yeah. and, and by night I've only seen those summer reports and they call it night because it's on a, a like a six to 10 PM uh, fishing trip. So they call it night, you know, eight o'clock is not night when it's in the summer, nine o'clock is not night. So I've seen some of those and they are very prone to heavy structure, right? You're not going to find tog in any number. I mean, you'll find them between structure, but you're not going to find a concentration unless it's heavy structure. So we're talking to what jetties, bridges, piers, pilings, wrecks, sod bank drops. Um, man, did I miss anything? Uh, and that pretty much covers up the most of it. Yeah, so it, it's essentially going to be, man, if you drop your hook uh, and you're bouncing the bottom, which is where they are, they're strictly bottom. Um, if you're not getting snagged, you're in the wrong spot. Or, or you got to be close to where the snags are, right? They'll come out of the snag area, so you don't have to be right inside the snags. But, um, you know, that's that's a good uh, good thing for people to know. If you're not getting snagged at all and you're drifting, uh, on a boat or a kayak, you're probably not in a great spot unless you're really close to that type of structure. Uh, they're very territorial, um, which is also something that you should keep in mind, right? So they will, they, they essentially have a home base. So um, you can fish one spot and get a ton of them and then there's nothing. Well, they didn't leave forever. They will probably be back. They're out foraging. They're out looking for, for food. Um, that's why one spot can produce a hundred fish and then nothing right after because they just moved they went out to feed um so the crustaceans what crabs fleas shrimp um uh that kind of stuff you can catch them on gulp shrimp and gulp shedders <laughs> although that's not one of my recommended ways to do it you absolutely can and i think one big thing i do want to mention up front is they're very slow growers um so the the new jersey state record fish the uh the world record fish they're probably around 30 years old uh, when they're when they're caught and they don't start uh, breeding until they're at least 12 inches. So that's why we have those limits where they are. And it is years between 12 inches and 15 inches, which is the 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 lower limit in New Jersey. So just think about what that's doing for conservation. So I want to make sure people know that um, they're very slow growers. So if you do catch a big one, um, think about that. You know, you could be taking a 20 plus year old fish out of the water and uh, it, it could have a big impact. Not saying don't do it. I'm just saying think, right? And then make your decision at that at that time. So, unless you guys have anything to add on the biology, um, I figured I'd take the nerdy part. Um, we can roll into to some of the other topics. So, no, yeah, that's fine by me. It's uh, yeah, you okay. pretty much said you know a couple things I had on my mind about that too. It's it's it usually takes about five years for them to reach that sexual maturity. And then it takes seven years to reach that at 15 inches. And then the, the growth can vary from, you know, one to two and a half inches a year. And it all depends on the fish and the location. And I guess how they're eating and everything as well. So it does take yeah. time for those fish to grow. Very slow I growers though. I mean, very, very slow. Um, so we're going to roll in and just so, for the people that are, are watching uh, live, you know, add any questions or, or any comments into the chat. Those that are watching a replay, comments in the video. We will make sure that one of us or all of us get back to you if you have any questions. That's for a hundred percent of people that that watch this. Um, you know, happy to answer any questions. Happy to bring it offline, off of YouTube, if you want uh, further conversation about anything. But uh, with that said, let's jump on in. Uh, we will be checking the the comments throughout. Um, so if we don't get to it right away, we will. Uh, but let's start off with, you know, for me, one of the first things that I think we should talk about is, is baits, right? So, so there are a lot of different things to go. So Ed, why don't you jump in first and, and, and take us through the baits that you're looking for uh, and why? Uh, baits. Um, I mean, it depends on what is uh, available to you. We, um, 
around here, there's some good side banks where we can go and uh, pick uh, fiddlers. Uh, depends on uh, the rock structure around. You can uh, find some of the Asian shore crabs. Uh, those are my favorite to use. They're small. You can use use them whole, pop the legs and the claws off, put them on a hook and, and rock. Uh, a lot of people like green crab. Not a big fan of them. Uh, they smell bad. They leave my hands kind of feeling oily and greasy. <laughs> uh, they're easy to come by, though. Uh, I was actually just listening to a podcast uh, the other day um, about people that actually fish for them. There's they're starting to, uh, restaurants are starting to offer them as food for humans and all kinds of stuff. I don't know if anybody else has cracked one of them guys open, but I would eat them. Um, no, so I, I'll just I just want to throw this in there. So um, today's month, yeah. So yesterday, Ed and I actually went out um, like lunatics in the wind uh, and went tog fishing. I gave him my remaining green crabs because I didn't want them anywhere near. And then I forgot the bucket in my truck, which sat closed all day. Now it wasn't hot out. Thank God <laughs> my truck smells horrendous. So that actually the windows are open now as it's sitting in the driveway. Cause it is terrible, terrible. So yes, they stink. I can't imagine eating them. So sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Keep going. No, no, for sure. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I would not eat them. Uh, so we, we covered what do you have fiddlers, Asian crabs, green crabs. Uh, some people use the white leggers, um, uh, sand fleas. Uh, sand fleas are a great bait to use. They're easy to catch. You can buy them uh, live, frozen, depends on the shop. Um, I haven't had tried, even tried like any of the gulp stuff. It's just, I think the, the tog prefer the natural bait. They're just going to natural, they're going to go for that versus a, a, a gulp. Um, what else? I think that's, I think I covered pretty much all baits. I've, I've heard of people using mussels. Um, I picked a few off of a bank the one day. Uh, I never got around to trying them. Um, I think that's, that, that pretty much covers bait for me. John, do you have anything? Any, the anything one I thing I will add, um, a couple friends showed me back in the day. Um, one thing that I absolutely love during the winter, go to Sam's Club, buy a pound, a two pound bag of frozen peeled and cooked shrimp they will hit it it's just like sand fleas they they smack them like crazy and it's a one hit wonder type deal it, it they're they're there they're gonna eat the shrimp so that's <laughs> that's another bait that i absolutely love in the winter i'll have to give that a try and it, trust me it's a cheaper route than uh the hermits <laughs> yeah you'd see eric in the chat is saying hermit crabs as well um that uh for me, now I don't have as much experience with offshore uh, tog fishing uh, at all. I, I typically, you know, for my whole life have been inshore tog. Um, so I haven't really gone after the monsters, but a few times. Um, but hermit crabs are definitely a big offshore bait for them. Got to be careful with the shrimp when you get offshore um, because, you know, the sea bass are going to be all over it. The burgles are going to be on it the second it hits the bottom. Um, yes. You get those little taps. Um, yeah, so, so I, 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 the one thing I would say is we used to use fiddler crabs all the time, right? When I was, when I was young, but of course, when I was young, I, I wouldn't have fit the fat dad name. Uh, I was in really good shape and I didn't mind running around the beaches, uh, digging up fiddler crabs on the side banks. Uh, and it can be, you know, it can be exhausting. Uh, but I, I personally for inshore love fiddler crabs. And if I can find anyone that's selling them, um, I'm actually buying those before anything else. I just think that they're they're the perfect size. You don't have to cut them. You just rip the one claw off. Um, you know, you can cut the legs off if you want, um, but that's the way that I like it. I, I would go with the fiddler crabs. Um, I'm thinking maybe the, the green crabs next. Um, I also can't stand green crabs. Um, blue claw I've used um, if you can get them, uh, but also clam works really well. So I would assume the mussels would as well. I mean, they eat crustaceans, right? That's why it's such a sweet tasting fish. They're eating all the crustaceans. They have an outstanding diet and it transfers right to the meat. Uh, so that that's the way that I would look for it. So I, I would go fiddlers first, uh, but I really want to try shrimp more often. Um, you know, so hermits and, and white leggers, I think are more offshore. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that's what I would look in shore. Um, as far as have, have either of you ever caught them on gulp? Or never ever tried. I've heard of nope. it. I've never personally done it. I have witnessed a guy actually catch one on a gulp uh, minnow. 
four oh, inch in chartreuse. A, a, <laughs> a weirdest thing. I, I mean, I've witnessed it, but uh, can't say that I've tried it. And I don't think I will be. Yeah, I, I've caught one small one that I remember on a gulp shrimp, but I was striper fishing. Um, right. So it was on a bucktail that I was jigging next to the bridge. Um, and I caught a tog. It was, it was, I mean, when I say small, it was small. Um, surprised that it actually got it in its mouth, but it slammed it. Thought it was a striper until I pulled. And I was like, well, I don't know what that is. And it must have been 10 inches, you know, maybe. Um, but yeah, so, so I think that covers the baits. Um, guys in in the, uh, the live stream in, that are watching, if there are any others, throw them in the comments so we can share them. But I think that, that pretty well... Um, Pretty well covers it. Oh, a good topic, though, for the bait. So, Ed, you had mentioned yesterday that you actually will freeze the green crabs and use mm -hmm. those. Um, so we know your stance on it. I've never done that, uh, to be honest. John, what's your thought on that? You ever freezing I'm the not, crabs? I'm not too big on freezing the crabs. I hear you can get away with doing it with the fiddlers. I heard that still works out perfectly fine. For me, I like fresh green crabs. That's just me personally when I'm fishing the back. Dude, I'll deal with the slime and the oil all day. Um, it just, that's a preference thing, but it, to me, if they're frozen, I, I don't think they're, they're going to work out as well. Cause I've tried other baits that have been frozen. It just doesn't seem to work as white leggers. I've frozen them before taking them offshore and they don't do a damn thing. So to me, I think that it's freezing the greens. It may work in the back. It may not work out front. It, it's one of those things. Just buy a dozen, try it, see how it works. Yeah. Now I, I do know that frozen fleas will work. Um, yes, I, I've and not from personal experience. I've never frozen them to use for uh, for tog, but I have used frozen fleas down south um, for for flounder, and I've caught a ton. Um, so I'm going to make that assumption that because I was catching the flounder on the frozen uh, sand fleas, and I've heard from people that I know that they catch them on frozen sand fleas that they're good. So I'll give it I'll give it that one one degree of separation endorsement for the, the frozen fleas. I can personally say I had done that once just because I've had some left over. And we you know if you're buying the fleas, they're expensive. So I'm not going to have them go to waste. I've frozen them and, and they have caught some tog. It seems it's not the best bite, but it will work if you, you're in a pinch. You know, it. I don't want to belabor the point too much, but it seems to me that a flea actually would be pretty good to purposefully use frozen because of the way that they're constructed, right? So as they thaw, it's just a continuous little scent trail because once you put the hook through them, everything's going to come out, right? Uh, mentioned in the chat again, you know, the, the eggs, the orange. I mean, that's that's the part. When that's dripping out, you know you're going to get a bite from something quick. Um, so that might be that might be a good one. The crabs, not so much. Once the guts are out, it's it's out. Um, there's just a clean white carcass with some meat in the, you know, in the leg joints and everything. Um, so I think that covers the bait. Uh, and that's an important thing. So guys, make sure that you have, you know, you really could go with any of these. Um, but ask around and see what's working. Because I can tell you from personal experience, if they're biting on greens today, that doesn't mean that they're going to be biting on greens tomorrow. You can be in the same spot next to somebody who's fishing uh, white leggers. And it's only white leggers at that moment. It's only sand fleas. So bring a variety if you can. Um, you know, this past weekend, uh, Ed and I had fleas and greens. Um, and you had a couple Asians as well. So uh, I, I think. Um, no, but, I didn't have. No, no you didn't? Okay. I, had, I had a couple white leggers, small ones. Um, and they both seemed to produce the same bites between the whites and the greens. So. Okay. All right. I do remember fishing next to John last year and we were catching zero and the guy next to him pulls one in and he says, caught it on a green and we switched. And, uh, actually that's when I caught my, my personal best last year. So, um, it was because John told me to stop fishing the white leggers and switch to the greens. And, and I, that's what I ended up catching it on. So I still think I was stubborn that day and was still fishing the whites, but hey, whatever. <laughs> Uh, I remember you did switch because you went and grabbed them for me. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you that much. Um, all right. So let's, let's move on a little bit. The, a big thing for people that uh, are, are looking to start tog fishing is the equipment, the gear that you need. 
Um, so, you know, let's talk rods. Uh, John, your favorite rods and reels. John, for those that don't know John, um, he's one of those guys that pretty much has tried a lot of different brands, a lot of different reels. Um, he has personal experience on, on a lot of them. I have the, the rigs that I use here. Uh, that I can show in a minute, but John, why don't we start with you since this is this is really in your wheelhouse for the rods and the reels, and why don't you talk about an inshore setup before you talk about an offshore? All right, so uh, inshore setup, uh, it's I like to use lighter gear when I'm inshore. So lately, I've been fishing, you know, my spinning gear. It would be the Daiwa Saltus Back Bay 4000. I still keep that line with 30 pound Power Pro. Uh, it's just the way I fish because you never know. Sometimes in the back, you may still hook that big one. I don't want the line snapping, especially if I hook into that five, six pound fish in the back. Um, and I'll use probably about a 20, 30 pound top shot on top of that. Uh, when it comes down to the rod, primarily I've been using the Black Hole uh, Challenger Bank, the 691 uh, Ultralight. Um, it's like the trout water, rod of uh, salt water. Absolutely fun for backwater, but... Sometimes, again, I feel you might need something a little heavier. So that's when I'll break out. Uh, I built the Rod Geeks X Comp Series, um, the 731 and the 732. That's another one that has a lot of backbone to it. Um, the nice thing about those rods, it's a fiberglass uh, composite blend. Um, so that means you have a little bit of co uh, carbon fiber in there as well. Get nice sensitivity in the, the tip of the rod because of carbon fiber blend in the front. And then the rest of the back of the rod is fiberglass, so you don't have to worry about, you know, shattering the rod if it was a full carbon fiber rod. Um, so the 731 is a great spinning rod. You can use that back bay or offshore. Seems to be a great rod all around. Um, they have had double-digit fish hold in on that. Um, but the nice thing is you can feel every single bite through that. Uh, the 732 is what I've been using with the bait caster in the back. And again, I use that out front too, just because of the construction of the rod and the setup that I have going on. Um, again, you feel that sensitivity. It's a little more stiffer, but at the end of the day, at least I know if it's a big fish in the back, I'm going to pull it in. I could still feel the bite on a four inch blackfish, which this past Friday, yeah, we were pulling in four inch blackfish with that rod. So, um, <laughs> And then, you know, they, they go all the way up there. The power ratings are different when you say 732, 731, 733. It goes all the way up to 6. The ratings are broken down. If you go on their website, it'll tell you what the 6 stands for. It'll be a, like 80-pound, you know, mono, or it's rated for 20-pound mono. So every number, you know, breaks down a variation of what it's rated for. So me personally, those are the rods I like. Uh, when it comes to jigging, though, for spinning, I, I've been big on the Black Hole Challenger Banks, the 691, the 701, and the 731. So, and you could tell when you go from through those numbers, 691's ultralight, 701's light, the 731's medium. Obviously, use those de designations, you know, I'm fishing at Back Bay, inshore, offshore. It kind of speaks for itself right there. Yeah, so that that right there is a lot more than I ever Man, you go deep when you when you're talking <laughs> rods. I love it, um, and and, and, it, and this is good because um, I, I I don't recall ever. And for those that don't know, I, I fish with John a lot. Um, we head out a lot uh, in different species and everything like that. I, I've never seen John with something that I would consider a uh, well, even a, a budget setup. Um, <laughs> he he uses the print. You know, he's he's rolling with van stalls and. You know, Abbott's and you know all that stuff. Ed, how about you? What are what are you rolling out there with? Uh, typically, <clears throat> I was using uh, the Fenwick HMGs, like I told you before. Um, that was a good like all around inshore rod. This year, I picked up a uh, Jigging World Nexus. Um, it is a seven foot, I believe, uh, two to six ounce, uh, and then I have it with a. Um, there's an Abbott. Uh, actually, right here. Ugh. Uh, SXJ uh, 5.3 G2. Um, this is the newest, the newest setup I have. And then I have a um, for spinning. I have um, the Jigging World Nexus um, seven foot, but it's uh, one to four ounce for spinning. Um, right now I have that a uh, pen con like 2500 on there now. Um, so I've been using those two primarily um, 
I tried using the bait caster off the off the rocks. It was a little little wonky, but it worked. Um, I much rather use the spinning rod though. But that's what I've been using right now. So. Lost your audio, Rich. I'm sorry. Can, can you see that on the screen yeah. there? Yeah. So what do you think? Barbie rod? How, how's that going to hold up for Tog? Let's give it a go. <laughs> we should we should do a three-way challenge. We should all go get like Spider-Man and Barbie rods and, and have at it. I want to see John because I know what he'll do. He'll get the Barbie rod and he'll stick an avid on it. <laughs> he'll chop, chop the tip off of something good and make his own hey, barbie listen, rod. I got a pink accurate sitting right in front of me. I'll pop that on that barbie rod real quick. <laughs> I, I actually I love that that rod and reel combo. Uh absolutely love that one that you have there, John. Um yeah, so so for me, I'm gonna be um the one who's more budget on on uh on this conversation tonight. So and for the the reason is simply I want to use the same rod for as many things as possible. Um, I was, you know, I, I tell people and I'll show people if you see me out on the water, I typically have four rods. That's a hundred percent of the rods that I fish normally with the exception of a surf rod. Um, so I, I look for rods that are inexpensive. Uh, the big reason is because I'm, I'm nearly a hundred percent of the time on a kayak. Uh, and I have capsized. And I have lost a lot of gear, you know, hundreds of dollars in gear, full rod and reel setups, cameras, uh, all that stuff. So I want to make sure that if it goes over, I'm not going to be crying. I'm just going to be wondering where I'm going to get something in stock to replace it. So uh, for me personally, I'm going to tell you that I am using. So I am using for offshore. Let me see if I can get this here without hitting the ceiling. I have a, I, I'm using this. This is a Shimano Corrado uh, rod. Um, so pretty tough to see in these little screens here, but it is a uh, conventional setup. And I'll tell you the, the mistake that I made last year is I put on, I put on this rod the wrong reel, right? So I went out offshore um, with this rod and the rod had plenty of heft to it, right? So, so it's, it's rated seven foot rated 17 to 40 pound. Uh, up to three ounce lure and it had all the backbone that I needed to pull in. I think it was an eight, eight pound tog, um, had all the power that I needed, right? I could have, I could have lifted it straight out of the water all the way up to the deck if, if I didn't have a net nearby. Um, uh, but man, the reel is what let me down. Uh, we'll talk about the reels in a second, uh, because I, because I actually do love the reel that let me down. I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, but what I'm actually using right now, I'm not going to pull it up into the screen, but I'm using the star aerial medium, heavy seven foot rod that I use for nearly everything else. So the rod I tell people I've caught, um, you know, the tiniest of sea bass on check out some of the videos. You'll see these little tiny sea bass that I'm pulling in. Um, all the way up to, I think the biggest fish that was not a ray that I caught on it was a 40 inch striped bass. So, um, and and the biggest ray would must have been around 70, 75 pounds. So you can get some big fish on there, has some backbone um, and it's inexpensive. So you can get a star aerial for around 80 to $90 uh, when you can find them in stock. The Corrado I think is $120. Uh, and then I have the custom rod that John made for me. Um, but it just doesn't have the backbone that I want for Tog. And we'll talk, you know, before we move on to the reels, let's talk about why the backbone is important. Um, and the big thing is when you hook a Tog, for those that don't know, your first move needs to be to set that hook hard and start reeling and don't dip that rod tip, right? You, when you pull it up, you are not putting it back down because their first move, once they grab that crab or that bait or that jig or rig, they're turning and they're, they're looking for a hole to jump into. Uh, and they'll go head first. And once they get in there, they extend the pectoral fins and they'll, ex if they feel you pulling back and they'll extend their dorsal fin and those things just lock them in there. So you cannot pull a tog out. It doesn't matter if it's a three pound tog and you have 50 pound braid, you're not pulling it out. Um, so you need the backbone to get that initial hook set through that mouth. Now, if you get it in the lip, the hook set doesn't matter because it's so gummy. It almost, it's almost like glue on that hook if you get it good through the lip. But if you get it through the mouth, um, you know, you're going to need that backbone to drive it through there 
and you need to be able to hold it out, which means you need to have heavy drag, which we'll talk about with the reels in a second. You need to have the right line and you need to be able to get it away from that structure right away. And that's where I've made mistakes. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll roll into the mistakes I made. Why don't we go right around back to John. John, you wanna talk about the reels and what you're looking for, particularly the drags. All right, so when it comes down to reels, like you said, I'm expensive when it comes to that. Um, but, you know, again, I'm paying for what I'm, uh, you know, I'm asking for, you know, it's accurate is probably by far my favorite reels, hands down. It could be their star drag or it could be their, you know, lever drags. Um, made in America, these reels, they, they're designed to pull in tuna, but they make them small enough to do a bunch of these backwater fishings in, in inshore and offshore. It, it holds enough line, but this is a prime example right here. This is their 300 size. It fits in the palm of my hand. Um, it's, I think about 25 pounds of drag on these reels, which is plenty to pull in damn near anything. Um, when it comes to spinning setup, you did say I was running van stall. The problem with the van stalls that I found seems to be more of a, a top water reel than it is a bottom fishing reel. They'll work, but it seems to take a lot more time. So I need to switch back to Daiwa. Um, either I'll use a BJ. They're, they're cheap, they're inexpensive. Pick a 4,000 up for what, about 120 bucks. Load it up with 30 to 40 pound Power Pro. Um, I primarily been fishing the Saltus, which has a little bit more drag. I think they're rated at 22 uh, pounds uh, for the drag. Uh, the back bays are really nice because they're very small, but they also still hold a lot of line. And that's a nice thing about the Diawis that they just hold a lot of line, period. They say they're rated for 260 yards or 30 pounds. That's probably holding 300 yards. Um, and then I've been fishing the baitcaster. Um, I know you've mentioned Hurst before. Um, Josh is a good friend of mine. I fish with him a lot. Um, he's the one that turned me on to the baitcasting and jigging with a baitcaster for dog. Um, so I bought the Daiwa Alexa 300. Uh, the power, which is, I think, a 6-3 gear ratio over the 7-3. Um, and again, 25 pounds of drag. Do you necessarily need that? No. But in your case, if you go back to the video of, like you said, you messed up using the wrong reel, you need that power. Because we know you had something hooked on big that day. That's when that, that comes into a factor. I need that power behind that reel to get it out. Because, again, it could be a 15-pound fish but it's gonna act like a 50, 60 pound fish just trying to pull back down on the rocks. So that's me personally, that's what I like to use. But if you look in the ratings, anywhere from 15 to 20 pounds of drag should be no problem to pull these fish out. Um, and there's a lot of options out there. I know a lot of guys like fishing the Stratix. I have nothing bad to say about Shimano. It's just not me though. Um, that's one way to go for the spinning rods. Um, I know a few guys like fishing the uh, the diet with salt is a uh, conventional real stuff. And there's other guys that use pen. Um, again, not a big pen fan, but there's a bunch of options out there. Like I said, looking at 15 to 20 pound range, you'll be all right. Ed, what's your thought? Hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> so for me, uh, I, with talk, I prefer conventional. Um, I have a couple pen battles that are more than strong enough to, to tog fish with. Um, but I can, I prefer the conventionals. Uh, so the, that's why I went the, with the G2, um, because it's, I can use it for dual purpose. I can use, I used it this summer fluking and now it's going to be my main, uh, you know, my main tog setup. Um, last year I had, uh, a Bass Pro setup. It was this Ocean Master Gold conventional reel and then the, the rod was fine. Uh, it was one of their inshore rods. Um, they worked well. Uh, I hooked into it like a six pounder uh, out on the racks, and that thing I had to, to drag max, and it was still pulling fine. Um, so that prompted me to try to get into something a little heavier duty. So that's fine with the, the habit. Um, spinning gear, like I said, I, I primarily use pen stuff. So uh, I have a 4,000, 5,000, I think a 6,000. Um, battle so depending on the rod that i'm using that day i'll what i'll you know i'll set it up gotcha uh for me uh inshore I, I told you the rod that i'm using star aerial 
Um, and right right now what I have on there uh, is a Stratic, uh, like John mentioned, but it's it's about a 15 year old Stratic FL. If, if they're, I mean, it's one of the original, I think, of that model. Um, and it's a it's a four thousand or sorry five thousand, which really feels like a three thousand to me. Um, and I use the fifteen pound braid on that. Um, where I made the mistake last year offshore was I was using that Corrado and I was using an Acuras S three bait caster. Um, so I have that on. Let me pull this rod here. Let's see if I can show people what that reel looks like. So right here. My so phenomenal. low profile uh, bait caster. I got the, the power handle on there. However, the problem that I had with it is it wasn't really paired really well with the with the rod that I was using. And I say that knowing I'm probably just going to do the same thing this year. Um, but I had that spooled up with 30 pound Power Pro. Um, and when I hooked uh, what John's talking about, I, th I think I was in. Yeah, it was in the one video um, from last year. I hooked into a tog and it was big. I mean, and when I say big, I had already pulled in an eight pounder um, and it, it worked fine. It has 18 pounds of drag on it, which is, you know, perfect for fluke because you're never going to need that much. I, like I, I, I actually caught again in videos this year, uh, I caught a 40 inch bass on that um, or a 30, 38 uh, inch striper on that. I caught a big slammer blue 36 inch on that exact rod and reel combo. Uh, the Corrado plus the, th that Acurus. When I hooked this tog, I got it out of the structure somehow and I gained line and I literally had it locked down because I had 30 pound on it. I had a rod that I really didn't care about. I don't care if the, the Corrado breaks it. I actually found it in the garage. Um, didn't know I had it. So I was like, all right. Um, and, and I had it up and it took off and it went straight down and it got wedged. And I didn't want to give it up um, I was trying to impress John who was standing next to me. So I let it sit for several, you know, not several seconds, but probably 30 seconds and it moved. Right. So that's the, that's, that's a trick. If it goes in the rocks, give it some slack and see if it comes out. It came out, this thing came out and man, I started hauling and it's coming up and it's coming up. And just as it gets about halfway up, it must've been 60 feet of water, 50 feet of water. It's about 20 feet down from the boat. It went down again couldn't stop it. And the drag was locked. I mean, it pulled now it didn't just, you know, go burning off like a shark, but it pulled that drag out. So um, for me personally, I would say you're going to want 18 to 20, probably 22 would have been fine. That would have stopped it. Um, the rod had plenty of heft uh, to, to handle whatever was on the other end of it, but that's the power of it because there was no way it was a world record, right? I'm not saying that. But um, it, it, it probably was a 10 plus pound fish um, and it, it treated the reel like it wasn't there. Right. So um, so when you're going offshore, be careful. I, I, I personally would go a little heavier this year uh, if I go out and get a new reel. Um, so just keep that in mind. But in the back again, um, you know, John, I know you don't like pen Ed. you like pen. I love pen. Um, I fish pen my whole life. Um, and I, I actually use, again, the budget version. I use the Pen Fierce 3, which has the same drag as the Battle and uh, what is it, the Conflict? Uh, the, conflict the upper one. The, there's a Conflict, and then there's another one that starts with a C. I forget what it is. It, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you said, the Clash. clash. Yeah. 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 So it has the same drag, right? So it's smooth, um, it's good reel. Um, I've dunked them. They handle everything. Again, I catch a lot of big fish on that. You'll see them. That's what you'll see in almost all of my videos. You'll see a pen fierce three uh, in my hand at some point or another, because I, it's my favorite reel. Um, so I, I will use that inshore 3000 size. I would not use that offshore. Um, it's again, that's 18 pounds drag. And, and personally, I just feel that uh, a spinning reel, 18 pounds is not the same as a conventional or bait caster. It, you're going to pull, I don't know if it's technically true or not, but I don't feel the power of that drag on a spinning reel like I do on even that bait caster. It's the same drag. It's 18 pounds for the Fierce 3 3000 and the Avid S or the, uh, not the Avid, the Acuris S3. Um, but, you know, that's, that's my thought on the reels. But again, I personally, if you're in a kayak, go budget, get a pen. <laughs> that's, that's the way that I look at it. <laughs> 
Um, all right, so let's go through the other tackle real quick. So um, not the other tackle real quick. Let's talk first about line. I assume you're both using braid all the time. Yep. Okay. Um, I personally, I, I use braid. I will say this. If you're offshore, use braid. Even if you're a mono guy, use braid because the one thing you don't want to deal with is the extra drag on mono. It's thicker. Um, and that's where actually using a lower, uh, a lower uh, test on the braid is going to be better. It's going to get, it's going to cut through the water easier. It's going to pick up less drag on the water, which means the best thing in the world, you can use lighter weights. You don't have to be using those eight ounces to keep it down. You may get away with a four ounce where other people are dropping eight ounces. Uh, if you're using rigs or, you know, an ounce and a half where other people are using three ounces. And when you're talking about tog and the way that they bite, they have that rapid bite. Although, which I'm not convinced is actually the tog. Um, I think that's the burgles swimming uh, around sea bass and the around. sea bass. Burgles or sea bass. But you still have to feel the tog and they will do that quick snap. And that's where they grab it and they take off uh, and head back to those rocks. But it's all about sensitivity. If you're sitting there with, you know, which is one of the reasons I don't like rigs as much. If you're sitting there with eight ounces. Um, you know, it's, it's tough to feel. So I think the braid just transfers that feeling so much better. And then I use personally a monofilament leader. I think that transfers it well enough. Fluoro. Okay. Use fluoro if you want. I wouldn't think about using wire. Uh, what are you guys using? Good, John. Uh, for me personally, uh, when it comes to spinning gear, I'm not using no more than 40 pounds uh, braid. And it could be the super slick. It could be the 32. I find myself slipping back over towards Power Pro super slick. Um, you used to use suffix a lot, but I, I think it's just a preference thing. Um, but I won't use no more than 40 pounds. Um, and then I'll usually top shot it with 30 or 40 pound mono on the spinning rod. Um, depending if I'm doing bay, inshore, or offshore. Um, when it comes to conventional, I have found myself, if you're fishing out towards, you know, Reef Site 11, Reef Site 10, Cape May Reef, places like those, I'm using 60 pound or more on my conventional gear with sometimes an 80 pound top shot, depending on if we know if there's big fish around. If we know there's big fish, I'll put an 80 pound top shot on no problems. Just because if I don't want to lose that big fish, I'm still after that double digit. I can't get it, so I'm making sure I'm getting it in. Right. <laughs> Set you up with a telephone pole and some steel cable. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, I'm using uh, on my Avid setup, my Bay Caster setup, uh, 30 pound um, Power Pro Depth Hunter. Um, uh, kind of a cute rainbow color, and you you pay attention to it. It is, I believe it's divided up in five foot sections. So you can kind of gauge your depth if you're on like a head boat where you don't know where the hell you're at or if your depth finder breaks or something. I don't know. I figured I'd give it a shot. Um, leader, I'm using 30 to 40 pound fluoro. Um, I like the fluoro for the uh, abrasion resistance a little bit better than, than mono, I think, um, for the price difference. If, if it helps, it helps. Um, and then in uh, spinning gear is either 15 or 20 pound, uh, you know, my typical go to for fluke and anything inshore back bay stuff. Um, I don't, if I'm going for big fish, I don't bring, I don't even bother bringing spinning gear. So. Yeah. I, 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 there's just something about offshore and the really big fish in the spinning gear on the bottom. It just, I don't know. It, it just doesn't feel right to me. Um, but, you know, that's how I was brought up. We always fish conventional when we were on the bottom. We fish spinning up top. Um, unless we were going out for bluefish offshore, we'd use the spinning gear then because you have to be able to pick it up and cast if you see a mahi <laughs> or you see something floating by. So uh, it was more out of uh, versatility that we did that, and I got used to that. But um, definitely um, – Definitely in 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 line with with you, Ed, on on what I'm using. Um, I just use the blue Power Pro. I use any Power Pro. I, I personally don't like Suffix. I've had personally some bad experiences with it, um, but I know a lot of people that swear by it. So you know, maybe. So you know, I, but I've never used it, so I have no no opinion. I I've always used Power Pro. What I, I will not either... use is Spider Wire. That stuff is garbage. Uh, <laughs> 
I've never used spider wire. I, I will say this though, in defense of suffix, even though I just said uh, I've had bad experiences with it, it was either the braid was bad or it was just spooled terribly. Um, which I, 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 I think it was the braid actually, but, um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure because the shop that did the that spooled it has never spooled anything bad for me in the past. So, yeah, I, I, I stick with, with the Power Pro. With anything, it might have been a bad batch. You never know. Could have been. Could have been. All right, so let's talk. Ed, you're going to have to take this one and start. Um, although I know John has a lot of theories and thoughts on this one. Let's talk about the 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 real terminal. Let's let's talk about the hooks, the jigs, and the rigs, so on and so forth. What are you using inshore, and uh, what does it look like? I am, uh, you know, Mike's in the chat. I'm from the school. Mike, use the lightest weight you possibly can. Um, depend, depending on current and stuff like that, you got to feel it out. I mean, there's days I've tied on four different jigs just to figure out what's going to hold, what's not. Um, you know, shameless plug, I do own Captain Hank, so I do make jigs. So this was our Gen 1. Uh, this was the, you know, uh, top jig that most everybody's going to see with the, with the round hook. Uh, this year we did, we started, uh, playing around with hooks. So we started to, you know, trying different styles, different things. Um, and then this is what we came up with. Um, and we seem to, to, that it works out pretty well. Um, with the angle of the hook, um, you know, when you set the hook, so just, I picked the smallest jig I could find. <laughs> So your line's going to be tied, you know, here with the angle of the hook. When you go to set that hook, the jig's going to rotate. So at the angle, it's going to drive it right up into that lip. That's what we've we've discovered so far. Um, and then rigging makes life, you know, easy. It presents, you know, you're able to present a sand flea, you know, with that hook point exposed. So when that fish comes in, they're going to grab the whole thing. You're going to set the hook. It's going to rotate up and then that hook's going to set and then will either fall off or swing away so that's that's the jigs that we like to use um like i said lightest weight possible so depending on current uh behind you know pilings and stuff you're going to have those eddies and those you know current breaks you know you can get away with you know a half ounce um even down to we have molds for quarter ounce uh there we use those more for the sheets and stuff like that but yeah i mean try to use the least amount of weight you can that's my my thing. Um, do you want me to touch on rigs, or you guys got something you want to? Yeah, well, why don't you show the rigs so people know? You know, when we're talking jigs versus rigs, what what it looks like because so, you know some people may not know what they want to do. So as far as a rig goes, this is how I was taught to tie them. I do two dropper loops, um, and I point the hooks facing each other. So when you go into a crab, um, you're gonna you know take the legs off. Uh, put one side on one hook and one side on the other so that you have, you know, two hooks with the with the crab presented in the middle. Uh, I just quick tied this. So I would have a little bit more leader, um, obviously, between my main line and uh, where I tie these dropper loops. And then uh, eight to ten inches below that, you know, it's going to be your, your uh, surgeon's loop with for weight. And then if, I'm, if I am forced to use rigs, this is the style weight that I prefer. Uh, it seems to lay flat on stuff. It doesn't get hung up in, in the in the wrecks as much, uh, and it likes to move. So that's that's my go-to rig and jig setup. Uh, you, you guys have anything different, John? Uh, for me, at least I could say for back bay jetty fishing, ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, my fish and jig. I will never fish a rig. I seem to snag up more when I'm using a rig in the, the back areas than I do, you know, say inshore wrecks and offshore wrecks. Um, so, I mean, there are so many different companies out there with jigs and whatnot. Um, me personally, I, I'm not going to get into it too much, but, you know, there's a couple companies out there that I use and they have certain jigs that I love using personally that I'll use over certain styles. And people still ask how the hell do you catch fish on them? It's, just the way I like to fish. Uh, when it comes to rigs for inshore wrecks and offshore wrecks, I personally like fishing the, the uh, Belmar rig, which is your slider rig. Um, it means you have basically a dropper loop attached to another line that's coming out with a dropper loop. 
the hook snelled on the one end and you have a free floating hook on that that piece of line there that way you could take the two hooks and run it through a full crab if you want to you can run two pieces of crab if you want to but me personally i like to put a full crab on when i'm running that type of rig or i'll use a snafu rig which has a dropper loop in the center uh, six inches of the line go out to each side a hook snelled on each side of the line goes attached to your main line and again you, you hook a whole crab that way Gotcha. Uh, for for the rigs, um, I, I take a little bit of a different approach. So, John, I actually don't. I I wouldn't even know how to tie that one <laughs> that you're talking it's, about. Uh, the snap uh, can be a pain <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Uh, the Belmore slider is probably the easier of the two. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm I'm a little closer to Ed on how I do mine. So let me pull it over here. This is what I typically use. Um, I've never used those that other kind of sinker, but I, I have found that um, that this style is is good and and mainly because it doesn't get snagged up top as much as you know some of the some of the other ones that are, that have more of the the ball on the bottom. Um, it certainly don't want a diamond <laughs> a diamond one or anything like that. So I'm just going to use that. But but I, I'm essentially going to do pretty much the same thing as you. Um, but I'm going to come out on a dropper loop and I'm going to use a two aught or a three aught. Let's see if you can see that there. Kamikatsu, um, octopus, uh, two aught or three aught is typically what I'll use. I also don't use the bait holder hooks. <laughs> I don't know why, um, but I, I just don't use them. Um, and then as I come up to the top, uh, you can see right now, there's, there's no loop on it. I actually tie this directly onto the braid with an FG knot. One thing that I do differently, um, though, is I don't, I, I don't use heavy leaders. Um, so I actually do the opposite of John, where John is using maybe forty pound uh, line and, or let's say thirty pound line and forty pound leader. I'll use thirty pound line at the heaviest and maybe twenty five, maybe thirty pound leader. But I never go over my line with the leader simply because. I'd rather replace the leader than the line. Um, so I don't know. I'd rather lose all the rigs than, than snap off the braid somewhere in the middle. Um, and th that's just the way that I do it. However, I also can guarantee that I lose more fish from the abrasion in the rocks. Um, and I do have to change out my leaders throughout the day uh, when I'm tog fishing because they do get really heavily, heavily abraded. And I have to, I have to, right? I can't wait as long as John, who's dropping a 40 pound, uh, if I'm just fishing a 20. So, so that's what I'll do. Also, I do like the, uh, uh, the, uh, the rigs, uh, I'm sorry, jigs. I won't use a rig unless I absolutely have to. Um, I just don't like that, that style of fishing. Um, and I also believe that for me personally, rigs make me lazy. And TOG, a lot of people think you just drop it and let it sit. And you can, but you shouldn't. You should be moving that. And for me, it's for some reason, it's just a mental thing I have. If I have a jig on there, I'm jigging. I'm moving it. I'll let it sit. And I find that the tog bites that I, I, I actually won't let it sit on the bottom though. I'll try to lift it up just, just a fraction above the bottom. So the second something touches that, even if it's this far off, you know, an inch off the, the bottom, I'm going to feel it touch it every single time nothing's going to be laying anywhere and i find with a heavy weight on a rig you 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 may tend to lose some of that tension between the line and the weight and uh for me it just doesn't work out i just can't i can't dial myself in on it so so that's what i'll do to, to comment on that i think it's more so that the hooks are offset from the main line than anything because once the weight is down you know you'll have tension between you know, the weight and your, your line. But I think right. having the hooks offset like that is what, you know, takes away some of the sensitivity. Yeah. Right. Right. So it kind of flutters on the side. Also, I, I only use one hook um, mainly because if I'm ever, if, if in the past I'd ever considered using uh, the rig, it's, it's in a very snaggy area, right? You typically don't run into that inshore. You can move a little bit, you can move a couple feet and manage that. Um, offshore, if you anchor over a wreck, you are where you are, right? And you don't really have much say in it. Um, 
So, uh, so, so that's just personally how I do it. Um, but, but for those that are new to tog fishing, they both work and they both work really well. There will be some days where one will clearly outperform over the other. Um, but I think, I think a lot of that has to do with the style that the people are, are fishing. And, and I, I tend to believe that the less active, the less uh, productivity that you're going to get. So be active on that. Keep it moving, keep it jigging. Um, and tog for people that aren't aware, they look just ugly and lazy. They are not look at some underwater footage of them. They are extremely aggressive. Um, they're extremely territorial. Uh, sorry What's to cut that? you off. I actually have a mount sitting right here. We could actually show the, uh, the guest. Uh, oh yeah. What a tog actually looks like if you wanted to do that. Yeah. If you, if you want to grab that. Yeah. So while John's grabbing that, um, so tog are extremely aggressive, extremely territorial. And that's where, uh, when we had mentioned earlier, like the little rapid fire machine gun and, you know, it's the burgle, it's the, it's the bass and they're the ones hitting the crab first. And then you feel that actual strike. Right. And typically if you watch underwater footage, that is a tog saying, uh, uh, my territory, my food, it's noticed it because all these little fish are all over it and it streaks right through the middle of them. They all scatter. It hits that bait hard and immediately turns to head back to where it was sitting. Um, so, so keep that in mind, extremely aggressive fish. Um, John, you have the, you have the mount yeah. there. So this is actually a wooden mount. Um, this is kind of what the teeth look like. <laughs> They have these donkey looking teeth. Yeah. Uh, I had a guy carve this up for me. It's not it's not a world record fish. It was actually a tough day fishing, 15 inch fish. I just got lucky and managed to pull out a tag tog. Um and at that point everyone's like, dude, just take it home. It's dead. It's got the bends. All right, it's going in the cooler. I mean, I don't want to take a tag fish, but it ain't going to survive when its eyeballs are popping out of its head. So right. it, it's, it's one of those catches. It's like, all right, well, I got to get a mount made up for that. So yeah, you know, Delaware sent me a whole, you know, paper gift card for Bass Pro. I got to keep the tag. I put the tag in the fish, but nice thing is at least we're talking about it. People get an idea of what these ugly creatures look like. <laughs> yeah, they're ugly, but boy, do they taste good. Definitely. Ah. And man, do they fight. <laughs> They can't really disagree with that. They, I think pound for pound, they're the they're the strongest fighting fish, uh, at least inshore. I mean, striper are fun, but they don't they don't have the they don't dog you like like these tog do. Yeah. Let me jump in with this question. Here, let me throw it up there on the on the screen. We all know Josh, Josh, Josh Hurst from Hurst Tackle. Oh boy, How do you feel about I... circle hooks for tog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if uh, Josh is breaking my stones here or not, but he knows I love fishing circle hooks for top. Um, it's just something I, I picked up. I picked up octopus circle hooks, and I absolutely love it. I don't yeah. know what it is. I have more consistent bites and more catches that way when I'm rig fishing. Yeah, so circle hooks, to me, you know, everyone's complaining you have to use them for striped bass now. Um I think it's funny because I've used them for uh, decades now um, for striped bass. They just work. And and the way that, um, and, and I think they would work better for tog simply because uh, of the way that a tog picks it up and leaves immediately. It's going to, it's going to set it and hook itself. Um, you know, people think that they're chewing on the, the crab and tasting it. <laughs> they're not, they're sticking the whole darn thing in their mouth and they're chomping down and taking off. Um, so, yeah, I see why you like them. I personally have never used circle hooks for talk, you know, full disclosure. I can see why you would like them. Uh, but again, I don't like using rigs. Yeah, I'm the same way. I'm, every every time I've tied a rig, it's used octopus circles, but uh, small fish. That's, that's really all I've gotten on a rig. Um. So let's go into tactics real quick. And, and, and actually, um, there, there's a, uh, a question here. I, I have a comment on it. Let's see if you guys have a comment from Steve. It only catches them at near slack water. Uh, pretty short window. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Where do you want me to, to start off on this one? Uh, where are you fishing, uh, number one? I mean, not the specifics, but uh, are you on a jetty? Are you on a, you know, 
on a boat behind pilings, you know, that that's kind of where I would start to try to figure out an answer for that. Um, that's, that's, it really depends where you're at. All right. So yeah, jetty, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. So for jetties, <clears throat> you're going to want to be on, you know, the, the backside of the current. Uh, so if you're standing like on a jetty and you have an outgoing current, you're going to want to be on that right hand side. That way that the, the, the fish are going to, they're not, they're lazy. They're going to want to, you know, not have to put out as much energy to stay put and stay where they are. Um, I've noticed when I'm fishing jetties and the tide starts to switch, I'll go to the opposite side and they'll be there. Um, you might want to give that a try. Yeah. John, you want to chime in? I, I was going to agree with Ed hundred percent. There is location, location, location. Uh, biggest factor is, you know, which way is that tide moving? Which side of the jetty are you fishing on? Um, it, it wins another big factor too. A lot of people don't realize, you, you know, you start to get those south blows. That water gets a little bit dirty. Fish tendency, you know, the fish have a tendency to get that locked all just because the sand's getting in their gill place. I won't even attempt for it. Um, so, like I said, me personally, I like to fish the last two hours of incoming and the last two hours of outgoing on a jetty. And it seems to be, you know, a four hour window seems to be good for me. If I'm at a dead low tide, I, I'm not really picking a big fish. I'm picking smaller fishes. I see. Oh, <laughs> see <you> John. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be back in in a minute. Um, yeah, so so let, I'll, I'll jump in real quick on this. Um, you know, I'll add John back in. He just bounced in. John, you want to finish your thought? Um, now nah, go ahead. Take off from there. I know you're in the midst of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I, I'll say this uh, to this question. Um, the, you know, as Ed had mentioned, and John was talking about uh, the the water current definitely has a, a big impact on tog, um, and I've done a lot of research on them, uh, and and what I have found um, pretty commonly is that those that have really studied them over years have noticed that there is a pattern that they are more active at slack tide, uh, uh, or or lower current flows than they are when there's a lot of current. And it is simply because they are going inactive and hiding in these eddies behind rocks, in between rocks, behind pilings, um, along side bank ledges on the backside, and they're not looking to eat at that point. So unless you drop right in front of them and you you taunt them enough with the jigging, they're probably just gonna let it go by because you know, if you look at it this way, um, if I'm hungry, I'm just literally walking 15 feet from here, I'm opening the fridge, I can get whatever I want, right? For the fish, uh, they literally have to get more calories than they uh, than they expend every time they go out to get something to eat. And a tog is going to use a ton of calories with the size of it, uh, the power that it's putting out every time that it makes a stroke with that tail. So it's not going to waste any energy fighting a, a strong flow. Um, and, and the other part of it is they are known to leave their structure where they're sitting. They, you could be fishing and they're not biting. They're right under you, right? If you're on a jetty, they will actually leave at slack tide or as the current slows and they will go out up to, um, I think it was a half a mile uh, and look for mussel beds, look for clams, look for um, areas where crabs are getting washed off of the sod banks, which is a great time to fish sod banks at the top of the tide, right? When it's changing uh, because those crabs and the shrimp and everything are getting washed out of the grass. Um, so that could be a big reason. They, they are not going to be fighting that that uh, strong current. So always fish the backside. Uh, that's your best chance at any tide. But you will find that um, once that tide does start to slow or, or near slack, they will probably pick up and a spot that's been uh, producing very little for hours could end up just blowing up and you could pull out 50 fish, you know, within a five foot area because they just went active. Now they're out, they're they're picking everything up that's that's all around them. Um, so keep that in mind. You know, it's not, it's certainly not a fish that you want to fish all day, right? Plan it around the tides. Um, you're doing the right thing near slack tide. So as John said, the first, uh, the first, the first two and last two of each tide um, are going to be the way to go. So that'll give you about four hours. And 
before we move on to touch on uh, what Steve just added, uh, how are you fishing those? Your what are you fishing? Are you fishing rigs, jigs, um, and are you um, keeping tension on your line, uh, or are you letting it go slack? Because with with the tog, you want to keep tension on your line constantly. Uh, you know, any slack in the line, you're you're obviously not going to feel it. Yeah, good point. And that was a that was a problem that I was having yesterday in the wind. Um, especially off the jetty because you get the bow in the line. If you have a bow in the line, you're done. You know, they're, they're literally mm -hmm. going to pick it. Um, they're going to eat the crab and then they're going to spit that, that entire rig out. Um, and, and, and at that point it's too late. So you got to try to keep tension on it all the way down. Um, and, and if you can't, well, you need to move, which is what we ended up doing, ended up then getting into some fish later, but, um, yeah, so ju just keep that kind of stuff in mind. And any other tactics that you want to share um, for going out and picking up these fish? The only other thing I can say is is you're you're building a bite too with tog. Um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna pick through smalls. Uh, the other the only other thing I can add is when you're clipping legs and stuff, chum the waters, get them things eaten. You get the scent in the water. Um, like I said, it's it's a build a bite. It's not always you know dropping reel. You might have to you know, work at that spot for a little while um, before you start catching fish. Good point. Um, John? Uh, I totally agree with that. And, you know, thinking about this, just sitting here, you know, we're talking about tactics and everything, too. One thing to keep in mind, too, when it comes to tactics, if you're actually on the fish, that bite can change instantly. It, it can be you know, a tap, 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 or it could be a one hit wonder. It, it, you know, it, it's that bite could change every 20 minutes. And, and these fish constantly change. Like you said earlier, when we were talking baits, green crabs work today, sand fleas are working tomorrow. Uh, it's that bite changes too. So not all the time, it's just going to be the same. So you have to keep an open mind. You have to start learning the different type of bites as well to know when it's going to for these fish. Yeah, I agree. And, and I was actually going to talk about building the bite. Um, for those that have watched this channel before and, and watched any of the TOG videos, I, I typically mention that um, because I want people to understand that uh, sometimes not getting something is productive uh, for several drops, many drops, a dozen drops, right? You're not getting anything, you're losing that bait, but you're also, you're getting them interested. Um, and once it turns on, man, it goes. I mean, it's just, it's, it's nonstop. It's not necessarily every drop, but you know, you start getting into, you know, you could get 30, 40 fish in an hour, um, you know, and go through your bait in no time. Uh, but it's all about building the bites. If you, if you're in a spot that you think should have them um, and you're convinced that you're, you did a good plan, uh, follow through on it. You know, don't just sit there, uh, you know, like striped bass, you're going to, you're going to fish a spot. You're going to do five casts six casts and then you're going to move on right you're there maybe five minutes if there's nothing you're gone uh that's the way to fish striped bass if you're fishing tog and there you're there five minutes you just wasted your own time because you didn't do what you you didn't do enough to to really check that spot out and and i'm talking i'm not even saying if fan cast just drop it in the same spot if you think that's the right spot drop it there and drop it there for at least 20 minutes um do up to a half an hour 40 minutes if you're not getting anything then you can say, okay, it's it's probably not going to build in this spot. Uh, for the foreseeable future, I'm going to make a move and then think about where you want to go and then head to that spot. And then, again, as soon as you start in the next spot, you've now committed to another 20 to 30 minutes in that spot to try to build that bite. And I think that's absolutely key um, for anyone that's going to be tog fishing. You have to give it time. It's not it's – not, you're not out there hunting for roaming – um roaming fish like striped bass you're there for fish that are holed up close by um, that are actively feeding and if they're not actively feeding and they don't get turned on in 20 minutes move on move on it's not worth the time and it's not worth the bait another another thing i could add to that is to uh not fish the spring tide either because you have that you know that all that water rushing through it's gonna the current's gonna be 10 times crazier so try to fish the, the lower tide, um, you know, either side of the lower tide if you can. I mean, if you can't, you can't. It is what it is. But if op conditions are optimal, at least from land or jetty or something like that, that's what I would do. 
Yeah. Um, just to clarify for people that aren't familiar with what a spring tide is, a lot of, actually, a lot of people think a spring tide is just in the spring. Um, spring tides are actually, they coincide with the full and the new moon. The, it, it basically is the highest and the lowest tides. So um, you're going to have them twice a month, pretty much. Uh, you know, you're going to have the spring tides. And once, and, and if you're not familiar with how tides work and how the currents, the tidal currents work, if we get the full moon and you have that gravitational pull pulling in more water, it's going to move more water. So it's going to get deeper in the same amount of time. So you have that much more tidal flow to fill up that area. So instead of a, a, a high tide that's five feet above mean low tide, you now have one that's uh, six feet. Well, you have to get that extra foot in there in that six hour, eight hour, wherever it depends on where you are on the coast. Um, but in that tidal cycle, uh, on the incoming tide, you have to move another foot of water in there. So it's that much stronger current. Um, it goes back to that previous point. It's a good point, Ed, because um, if you're going to have that extra tidal flow, you're going to want to avoid it for the tog or really make sure that you're focused on finding a spot that doesn't have that flow hitting it. That's where you really want to look for those eddies, look for those protected areas. It's similar for flounder. Um, uh, spring tides are awesome for flounder but not in, the, not in all the normal spots, right? You don't wanna be right in the middle of that inlet on a spring tide. First of all, you may not be able to get to the bottom, but <laughs> you know, the, the flounder don't wanna be there either. They're just like the tide, yeah, you have to expend calories to get calories. So um, yeah, so keep that in mind. That, that's a really good tip. I, I hadn't even thought about that. All right, so um, I, think, I think we've covered, is there anything that we missed? Any questions that we missed? Let's see. Uh, real quick, uh, I hate to interrupt, but I am going to actually be stepping out. Um, I do have to make my way over to work. So, guys, I yep. really appreciate you having me. Um, yeah. Hopefully, we'll get to do a couple more of these in the future. Yeah, Absolutely. Man. John, thank you very much for joining the stream tonight. Appreciate it. Drive safe. Talk to you later. All right, guys. See you. All right. See you. Talk to you soon. All right, so I think I think we I think we've pretty much covered it. the other questions that I've seen here. I'm sorry if I miss any. John's asking what size hooks do you use? For me personally, uh, inshore, I'm using a two aught to a three aught. Very important though, Ed. Maybe you have a comment on this. Not all hooks are created equal. Just because they're the same size does not mean you should be using them, right? So gamakatsu is what I use inshore. However, they're not the the sturdiest of hooks out there. Right, so I have actually snapped gamakatsu hooks in the mouth of a tog in the past. And, and the reason you've, you've done that is because they are typically forged wire. Um, so if you break one open, you'll see um, the metal is actually, I don't know how to put it, it's, it's very porous and, and there's texture to it. Forged hooks are strong, um, but they're brittle. Um, so like you want, you kind of want to use a hook that's going to be, uh, that's not, not so much a forge hook, but you want to use something that's a little bit softer, believe it or not, because like it'll have some give, yeah, like the mustad. Well, some of the mustads are forged too. It all depends. Um, like I believe the black nickel ones are forged. Um, so like the older, uh, the silver Duratin ones, stuff like that. They're usually, a they're not a forged or I believe, uh, their wire is drawn out. Um, so you want to go with the try and try and use a you know a softer hook, uh, believe it or not. It'll like I said, it'll have a little bit more give to it, and it won't it'll bend before it snaps. I'd rather a bent hook and a fish on board than a broken hook with you know a hook eye maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, I've literally snapped hooks. Um, I found that um, honestly, I didn't look to see if they were forged or not. There were some owner hooks that worked well, um, but I did find some. Uh, they, they weren't the black nickel, but they were mustad was what I was using. And now I can't find them, um, but they, they seem to work well. But but for me personally, inshore, I'm doing a two aught to three aught. And that's what I'm using for pretty much anything. If they are, if they're the hooks I'm thinking of, I think I have quite a few dozen packs of them left that are they're now discontinued. But I got some in the stash. The so next time you're down, we'll, uh, we'll go through the stash. Of course you have. You should have them. <laughs> the hook guy, tackle guy, he's got to have them. Um, yeah, and, and any any final things you want to pass on? I got a couple things I want to mention to everybody. Anything you want to you want to close with? No. Um, I mean, I saw somebody asking about uh, baits again. Uh, if we wanted to touch back, oh, uh, there that will. Again. He's still in there. Yeah, will. Um, my preference is the Asian shore crabs. 
Um, second would be Greens, and then uh, San Feliz after that. Yeah, I'm pretty close. I really like Fiddlers as well. Um, and then only in an emergency would I use Gulp. Only I, in a severe emergency. Never even crossed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's never even yeah. been a thought. <laughs> yeah, so... All right. Well, I think guys um, don't go just yet. If you're still here, first of all, thank you very much um, again for, if you missed the beginning, Ed um, is, is going to be joining going forward for the live streams. Uh, and, and he's going to be here with me as co-hosts and we're going to, we're going to talk a lot back and forth about a lot of different, uh, a lot of different species, a lot of different tactics. We're still going to bring on guests tonight. We had John Creeley on for Creeley custom rods. Um, and, and we're just going to go through that way. And we're looking at every other week, same time, nine o'clock Monday night. On top of that, uh, let me just ask you, please. I hate to do this likes and shares and comments, uh, YouTube, you got to feed the YouTube algorithm. Um, so if, anything that you can do would certainly help out, uh, gets the video shown, which really helps the channel. The last thing I'm just going to tell you right now, this is kind of like a pre launch of it. This channel actually now has memberships. Um, so yes, you can be subscribed, but then there are also uh, membership tiers for people that want to help support the channel. Um, and uh, that is now live and you are able to do that if you so choose. And there's a little join button down below this video if you wanna check it out. There's three tiers with different um, different options, different perks and benefits from, from joining any of those tiers. I'm going to put out a video this week for people just explaining what they are, uh, and what the benefits are. If you don't want to do that, that's cool, man. I am just excited anytime that somebody uh, views a video, uh, even more excited when they comment. Uh, and actually last is the subscribe. I'm not so much worried about subscribers, but in the past year, we've had about 100,000 views on the videos. Um, and I literally am talking to dozens of different people, most of whom I haven't met, uh, but many of which I have met out on the water to go fishing with, uh, and, and just had a great time. Um, so as long as I'm helping you, that's the main, that's the main thing. But uh, I think put together some pretty cool perks for people. Um, so feel free to go check that out. Let me know if you have any questions. With that, Ed, thanks again. Anytime. Looking, thanks for having me. I'm looking, looking forward to getting to... back out on the water with you uh, before yeah. the next one. Uh, everybody out there, thanks for tuning in. Get out there, catch up those togs. Let us know how you did in the comments, right? Let us know that, you know, if it helped anything that you found, any feedback that you have for us, we're all learning at the same time. And with that said, thank you very much and tight lines. Take care. See ya.